The cotton industry helped stave off typhus because lice were killed by boiling clothes, and wool was destroyed when it was boiled, so cotton fabric became a welcome replacement. With more cotton mills, fabric became cheaper so people could change their clothes more often, and that helped because lice needed a period of constant warmth to grow, so the cotton plantations in the American South were allowed to ship immediately to cotton mill factories in England, while other countries that were unable to control their lice had to store their cotton for a requisite time to fulfill quarantine, and it often just rotted away. Sulfanilamide was invented in 1908 from a by-product of coal tar, and the patent expired after the Great War, allowing anyone to produce it. And sulfanilamide was not used as a healing drug until the 30s. When FDR's son was dying of an infection in 1936, a doctor from New York City gave the junior Roosevelt some sulfanilamide and cured him, and a vaccine for polio was finally found in 1954. As FDR's son was recovering, Hitler was getting even sicker, and it began around the winter of 1937-38 to 38 with one little medicine bottle, and over the next seven years there would be enough of them to fill a suitcase. According to a hot read written by David Irving, Hitler became a hypochondriac after hiring Dr. Morrill, and Morrell had Morrill, Morrell, had been a medic during the Great War and then served as an army doctor in a prison camp where he specialized in venereal diseases. Dr. Morrill gave Hitler injections of Eucodol and Eupaverin that were synthetic opium derivatives designed to be non-addicting, but they were not, and Eucodol was chemically similar to Percodan. Morrell administered tablets and dragees, uppers and downers, leeches and bacilli, hot compresses and cold poultices, and literally thousands of injections, liters of mysterious fluids that were squirted into the grateful but gullible Fuhrer every year so often that even Morel sometimes could not find anywhere to slide the needle into his chief's scarred veins. The Secret Diaries of Hitler's Doctor by David Irving New York Macmillan Publishing Company, 1983, page 11. Hitler's first vitamin shot in the morning had methamphetamine in it, and Dr. Morrill would inject Hitler before he got out of bed, and as time went on, Dr. Morrill had to keep increasing the dose. All of the major belligerent nations in World War II experimented with amphetamine and all of them issued the drug to military units. A German panzer veteran told us, when we missed sleep, we ate pervidin like candy. Without it, we couldn't have done what we did. The Medical Casebook of Adolf Hitler, His Illnesses, Doctors, and Drugs by Leonard L. Heston, M.D., and Renate Heston, and R.N., with an introduction by Albert Speer, New York, Stein and Day, 1979, page 99. Hitler would become immediately animated after an injection, and it was described as his becoming revived, and Hitler's little gold foil-wrapped vitamin pills had methamphetamine in them, and he would eat up to ten of these a day. According to the Hestons, Hitler had trouble sleeping and had trouble with his gums and had eczema on his feet so bad that he couldn't get his boots on, and he abused laxatives and scratched the back of his neck until it bled, and they said that Hitler had ringing in his ears ever since the night of the long knives, but most of all, Hitler had cramping guts and uncontrollable flatulence to the point where many orders were hurriedly agreed to and signed just to get out of the room. In addition, Hitler took nerve tonics and metabolic stimulants, and he had hormones and vitamins injected directly into his bloodstream, and the injections included procaine to mute the pain of the injections. Dr. Morrill claimed to have given very small doses, doses, but he was probably just trying to avoid being blamed for Hitler's failing health, and in February of 1944, Hitler gave Dr. Morrill the civil version of the Knight's Cross. In August of 1944, 
Hiller began taking cocaine twice a day on his doctor's recommendation, and he claimed that it make him th made him think more clearly. Science had not only gone awry with the medical experiments being done in the camps, but had taken a strange turn when electrical generators first came out and people would shock themselves, thinking it would improve their health. Some doctors got the idea that they could cure crazy people by shooting electricity through them, after which the patients would become quiet for a few weeks as their brains tried to cope with the damage, and then they stayed quiet for months as their personalities adjusted to what was left of their minds, and the doctors called this treatment successful. People thought that taking cold baths in the morning made them resistant to disease, but the truth was that people who were strong enough to take a cold bath in the morning were strong enough to take just about anything. The rate and velocity, the rate and velocity of ordnance used in the Great War sent many young men home shaking like trees in the wind, and they didn't want to call it hysteria because that had always been something wrong with women. But when soldiers came back from the trenches of the Great War acting like hysterical women, doctors took a more scientific approach and called it shell shock. The rich people who'd sent their sons off to fight the Great War did not want their brave sons to be called cowards. So the wealthy poured money into the field of psychology, and instead of being called hysterical, the term shell shock had a nice manly ring to it. The diagnosis was not quite science because only a few of the soldiers exposed to mortar fire had been affected, but these were in the tens of thousands and they were as wounded as if they had taken a direct hit. Psychology was sold as a science of the brain rather than as a social exercise, and after talk therapy and behavioral science failed to produce any clear results, psychologists allied themselves with medical doctors and the practice of psychiatry was born. Soldiers returned from the trenches with uncontrollable trembling and spastic bodies, and at first some of them had been given immediate courts martials and executed, but as more and more came back in the same condition, doctors declared it to be a physical disease rather than a moral or character disorder. The word stress would replace what was once called nerves, and people thought that soldiers were tough because they suffered, but the truth was that they just suffered. Soldiers who were given orders were supposed to do as they were told to make them feel that there was structure and dignity in the world, so psychiatrist, psychiatry proposed a welcome alternative to shell shock as not being mere cowardice or disobedience, but was given the designation of a physical disease. Because there was no provable physical component to shell shock victims, the idea of quote unquote mental illness took off like a rocket ship because people with money to spend were eager to blame their loved ones' behavioral problems on scientific causes rather than on ill breeding or neglectful parenting or on something wrong with God's world. The best thing about the idea of mental illness was that one's troubles were no longer the fault of having insufficient religion, and by removing the moral or spiritual element, people no longer had to be afraid that God made people sick on purpose. As people moved into cities, caring for ailing family members became too difficult, because there were no discreet cottages or outbuildings or secluded wings to shelter them away. Popular literature usually described at least one person in the family who'd simply gone berserk, and keeping these troubled people at home had become a real hardship with city living, and with the growth of factories where all hands were needed for work in the surrounding cities, caring for the insane and infirm became a booming business. Asylums were intended to provide a substitute family, with the guards acting as parents, offering moral advice and social training, but all they really offered was a rigid schedule and a predictable routine for the inmates. In America in 1874, Illinois became the first state to require a trial by jury before sending anyone away to an, as an asylum, and by 1900 there were no more hospitals for the insane and idiots, but sanitariums catering to those suffering, quote, nervous and brain illness, close quote, and instead of being insane, people were now called mentally ill. 
Half of the mental patients were women escaping from bad marriages, and these women were diagnosed as suffering from fragility or from nervous ex exhaustion, and many other patients were merely running away from financial difficulties. Sanatorium had been built to treat tuberculosis for which there was no other cure than rest, good food, and clean sheets, but TB was usually not arrested after that treatment, and it was not until after pasteurization of milk stopped tuberculosis and undulant fever that a cure for TB was discovered, after which sanitarium owners needed patients to fill up their health hotels. With the growth of the middle class, a larger number of dissatisfied husbands could pay to send away their wives, who were just as pleased to get away from their husbands, while poor women could just stay home and self-medicate. The epidemic of female complaints grew as asylums sought more customers, and some doctors searched for honest causes behind female health problems, but when shell-shocked sons came home from the Great War, the asylums had an overabundance of well-paying clients, and with the higher cost, the husbands turned to psychologists to find any excuse for their wives' maladies, without anyone coming close to blaming the husband for mistreatment. It wouldn't be until 1916 that Margaret Sanger would open her first birth control clinic. While in the countryside, families survived only if women bore the usual 11 to 17 children, because many hands were needed to keep the farms going, and half of those born would fail to survive into adulthood. The mental patients were given chloral hydrate that had been invented in Germany in 1832, and it was called knockout drops and was popularly, popularly used at parties in Mickey Finn's, so chloral hydrate had been the date rape drug of its day. Barbiturates <clears throat> were invented by Hermann Fischer at the University of Berlin in 1903, and he named them after his girlfriend Barbara, and Bayer called it Veronal and also made a phenobarbital they called luminol that lasted longer. The pre-barbiturates had been around as early as 1864, and one of the places that came up with barbiturate therapy was the University of Turin, a very pleasant place to have a psychiatric clinic, and a Swiss doctor in Zurich used barbiturates to get his patients to listen while he talked at them, and the psychiatrist killed one out of every twenty people they treated with barbiturates. Psychiatrists tried enemas and they tried emetics, and they would give mental patients poison and let them be sick for an hour and then sleep. And in 1917, a mental patient with syphilis was given malaria five times and cured after suffering the fever five times, and they would treat the malaria with quinine after it had done its work. Other psychiatrists tried malaria on some mental patients, and the doctor who did it received the Nobel Prize in 1927 but his cure for mental illness turned out to be a fluke because his successes were found to be due to a placebo effect. Penicillin was discovered in 1929 and was a waste product of fungus, just as alcohol was a waste product of yeast. And Americans figured out how to mass-produce penicillin in 1944. And with penicillin, there was no more plague of syphilis, and nor no more lots of other diseases, and psychiatrists tried penicillin on their mental patients, but it did no good. A Hungarian came up with the crazy idea of inducing seizures to cure mental illness, after observing that epileptics who went crazy had fewer seizures. And this doctor dissected dead epileptics and dead schizophrenics and reported that their brains were abnormal and in 1934 he started feeding camphor to his mental patients. The first person to receive the camphor treatment was a man who saw people waving at him, and he heard voices in his ears and in, and in his stomach, and when he was camphorized, the patient just stayed in bed, and then he stopped eating, so they injected him with camphor five more times, after which he felt so good that he escaped from the institution and went home, where he found that the cousin living with his wife was not a relation of hers at all, but his wife's lover, and he beat them both up, and the doctor declared him cured. 
Five years later, that doctor switched to cardiazole that was a cardiac stimulant. And hospitals all over the world started using it along with another induced near-death experience called metrazole that caused convulsions. Convulsions. Alongside the drugs, doctors started giving depressed people electroshock therapy, which gave many a new outlook on life and had a calming effect on the rest. And the best thing about electroshock was that the doctors didn't have to spend any time talking to their patients about their nihilistic hopelessness, which might be contagious. A Roman came up with a new kind of electroshock in 1938 while going to school at Turin under Nazi occupation. And the electroshock was like being in a car accident, and he took his idea, idea to Heidelberg before returning to Rome, where he started shocking dogs with electricity, and half of the dogs died, so the local dog catcher would come by regularly with animals for sale. The Romans, the Roman, figured out that if he placed the electrodes on the dog's temples, they didn't die. So he went to a psychiatric convention back in Germany with his discovery, where he announced that he wanted to try it on people, and nobody spoke out in opposition. All the best psychiatrists were in attendance, and so was a doctor named Cameron, who was working in Canada, who would end up as president of the American Psychiatric Association in 1952. Cameron worked at McGill University in Montreal and gave barbiturates to people, to patients, for ten days, then made them listen to a tape loop that said, Yes, my parents love me. Yes, I want to go home. It seemed to work, but the patients would forget their new programming, so he started giving them electroshock along with the barbiturates in order to empty their brains for the taped message. Cameron carried on with this for decades, doing more and more procedures until three years before his death in 1967, and in his last few years the treatment would be done without the patient's knowledge. In a footnote about Cameron in Shorter's History of Psychiatry, it said that in the author's opinion, quote, the CIA angle is irrelevant in that Cameron would have done exactly the same experiments without any CIA money, close quote. This footnote referred to a source for further reading, a book called In the Sleep Room, The Story of the CIA Brainwashing Experiments in Canada by Anne Collins, Toronto, Lester and Orpin Denny's Limited, 1988. The Roman had returned to his research by going to the slaughterhouse to get pigs for his experiments, and he was trying to discern the margin of error between a convulsive dose and a lethal dose in 1938, when a 39-year-old man was arrested for wandering around the railroad tracks, and while he was lucid and knew where he was, he claimed to be, quote, telepathically influenced, close quote. The man was also, quote-unquote, slovenly, and hadn't had a bath in a while, so they shaved his head and hooked him up to their shocking machine, and the man didn't remember getting the first jolt, so they cranked it up, after which he lay on the floor for a minute, and then he started to sing. They cranked it up further, and he held his breath in a convulsive state for 48 seconds, and after 11 treatments at that dosage, they let him go, having convinced him that the telepathy and hallucinations had been from mental illness, and the man went back to work, but his wife said that he still accused her of being a whore, and that he still talked to people who weren't there. Everybody thought this study proved a cure for mental illness, so a man who was half German brought the idea to England after stopping in Paris to show the psychiatrists the Roman's report, and a year later he brought the idea to America, where it became the number one treatment in psychiatric hospitals by 1944. They added a muscle paralyzer and a painkiller, and were able to make Fanny Farmer happy enough to put on lipstick again. And in a history of psychiatrists, psychiatry, Shorter said, quote, One may question whether shock treatments do any good to the patients, but there can be no doubt that they have done an enormous amount of good to psychiatry, close quote. A history of psychiatry from the era of the asylum to the age of Prozac by Edward Shorter, New York, John Wiley and Sons, Incorporated, 1997. 
The shock jocks and the talking therapists fought it out, and the shockers won because their treatment was less Jewish. Freud had been credited with the invention of quote-unquote talking therapy, and had come up with the phrase His Majesty the Baby, and Freud loved science, and Hitler hated Freud, and Freud had been born in Moravia and moved his family to Vienna to study medicine, where he found out that Austrians hated Jews too. Freud gave long lectures about how and why people were strange, and his lectures were interesting and very entertaining, but not quite scientific, and yet they were much more fun than church. Freud could write as well as he lectured, and after publishing dozens of books and papers, Freud would die in 1939 at the age of 83, three weeks after Hitler invaded Poland. In his desire to understand human behavior, B.F. Skinner had come up with the idea of behavioral science, and Skinner's father had been a lawyer who studied under Professor Woodrow Wilson and had written a textbook on workmen's compensation law. Skinner's father had tried to make money building trench mirrors for the Great War, but he'd run out of brass for the mirrors and the steel they used instead would rust in the trenches. Skinner's father spent a lot of time weeping in the bedroom, and when the grandfather died he'd left a sealed envelope to be read aloud to the family, and Skinner's father got everyone together in the living room and brought out the envelope, and the other grandfather read a few lines to himself and burnt the letter in the fireplace. B. F. Skinner went to graduate school at Harvard in 1928 to study psychology, and he moved in with a married girlfriend and her friend, and she kicked him out after a while and told Skinner that she had never enjoyed being intimate with him, and he concluded that it was her fault for not telling him how, and in his memoirs, which Skinner called his particulars, he talked about all the times he had ever tried to kiss girls. Before he went to Harvard, Skinner's parents had taken him on a tour of Europe, and he took an airplane to Switzerland, but they'd been forced to land in Munich, and Skinner said Skinner had been perturbed about the fuss German soldiers made over his lack of a German passport, so he went to Paris instead to watch naked dancing girls. Skinner tried to pay prostitutes but had too much to drink, and when he tried to tip the cab driver with some coins, they landed on the sidewalk, and Skinner wrote that most coins in France had become worthless anyway. Skinner wrote that his parents were unhappy about young people being allowed to kiss in the public park in England, and when he got to college... Skinner went to different places with his friends to pay for prostitution, and he was disappointed with that and wondered why the girls in his home town had made such a fuss. Skinner wrote in his memoirs about Prohibition wine and Prohibition beer and Prohibition gin in Greenwich Village, and Skinner watched the Valkyrie opera by Wagner and wrote that the staging was ridiculous, and this was the man who would become the father of behavioral medicine. Another icon in the field of mental health was Charles Darwin, who was an English hypochondriac regularly visiting spas, and Darwin would watch surgery before the days of anesthetic where people were gagged to stifle their screams. Darwin's father was obese and his mother was sickly, and so instead of becoming a doctor, Darwin decided to go to college to become a minister where he learned to drink. If the phrenologists are to be trusted, I was well fitted in one respect to be a clergyman. A few years ago, the secretaries of a German psychological society asked me earnestly by letter for a photograph of myself, and some time afterwards I received the proceedings of one of the meetings in which it seemed that the shape of my head had been the subject of a public discussion, and one of the speakers declared that I had the bump of reverence developed enough for ten priests, the essential Darwin edited by Kenneth Corey, Boston, Little Brown and Company, 1984, page 9. During the three years which I spent at Cambridge, my time was wasted as far as the academical studies were concerned. The work was repugnant to me, chiefly from my not being able to see any meaning in the early steps in algebra. I got into the sporting set, including some dissipated, low-minded young men. We used often to dine together in the evening, through these dinners often, though these dinners 
often included men of a higher stamp, and we sometimes drank too much, with jolly singing and playing at cards afterwards. I know that I ought to feel ashamed of days and evenings thus spent, but as some of my friends were very pleasant, and we were all in the highest of spirits, I cannot help looking back to these times with much pleasure. With much pleasure. Essential Darwin, page 9-11. Darwin learned from an African friend how to stuff dead birds, and he spent five years at sea on board the Beagle, collecting things to preserve in jars, and after amassing fifteen hundred creatures and four thousand other specimens, Darwin wrote Origin of Species in 1859, two decades after the discovery of anesthetic. Darwin's idea of quote-unquote natural selection, close quote, and survival of the fittest, appealed to people wanting to understand science rather than understand God, but people knew that Darwin was a secret transmutationist. With the Darwin idea, everything was blamed on genetics, especially crime and poverty, and this was because the new science of genetics was called, that was called, and this became the new science of genetics that was called eugenics. The Nazis thought, that the ancient Greeks had been healthier than 20th century people, and they believed the human race was in decline, and German scientists saw people living in cramped cities having babies born deformed, and they worked out the math to show scientifically that if something weren't done, there would be a defective human for every three healthy ones within 50 years, and as word spread, eugenics became a holy war. Germany was ahead of the rest of the world in science, and the language of science was German, and their published reports about eugenics were being taken seriously all over the world. Immigrants coming to America were shorter and stunted, having come over to the New World out of hunger in the first place, and the U.S. government accepted the scientific idea of genetic inferiority and passed laws about marriage and sterilization, and Americans were warned not to breed with the starving immigrants. Germans thought the whole country would be locked up in asylums or horribly mutated within a few generations if they didn't start practicing genetic hygiene. And racism was strictly science in Germany, and it was understood that genetically inferior people could be used for their labor, but were not to mix with the general population. Jews with a criminal record were declared genetically unfit and sent to concentration camps for quarantine for everyone's best interests, and the way the racial science laws were written, all Jews automatically became criminals for medical reasons. The Japanese asked for clarification about racial categories at the League of Nations before Hitler's war, but had been met with a wall of silence, and Japanese Americans were put into camps to protect them from other Americans, and many Jews would also believe the camps to be a temporary haven from those enlightened elites being scientific about the Jews' inferior genes. In America, IQ tests were created for the army, but the questions were culturally biased and asked about brand names sold only in certain stores or products only people in larger towns would be familiar with which products with which only people in larger towns would be familiar from shopping in those stores or from reading certain magazines, and theories about the genetic inheritance of intelligence came out of these military IQ tests. The idea of progressive degeneration became all the rage, along with the theory that bad genes went worse fast, and if a child was born with a genetic disorder, the parents were sterilized, and over a million procedures were done, even though many of the birth defects attributed to genetics were the result of poor nutrition, although that would not be proved until 1932. Whether or not nutritional deficiencies were a major cause of birth defects, paying for the care of degenerates and cripples was thought to be an unacceptable burden in the face of the unemployment and the inflation, and then with the high cost of Hitler's war, it seemed more scientific and humane to simply put damaged and genetically unfit people out of their misery. 
Elite Nazis had to prove their genetic history back to 1750, and euthanasia of the incurables would not start until 1939, and these would be given peraldehyde before entering the scientific gas chambers. After the atomic bomb was dropped and the scientific German camps were revealed, horrified people thought that scientists were mad and regarded them with the utmost suspicion. And while scientists were thought of simply as evil before 1945 because they'd been working against God, now they had proven themselves to be pr true monsters. One out of six casualties in Hitler's war had been psychological, so plenty of work became available for psychiatrists and their claims to a scientific method. Electroshock therapy had not been the only road psychiatrists went down during Hitler's heyday, but doctors operating on monkeys found they were happier about being kept in cages if part of their brain were removed, and that had been happening in Lisbon in 1935, and the following year doctors at George Washington University had been trying brain removal on people. By 1946, they were damaging the brain through the eyeball socket with an ice pick and leaving the cut-up brain inside the skull, and they argued about whether or not to make it an office procedure rather than checking the person into a hospital. An office procedure meant the patients could be kept awake because there were no nerve endings inside the skull to feel pain, and the man who thought brain cutting could be done on a walk-in basis went all over the country doing demonstrations, and his name was Freeman, and he used a real ice pick. Freeman drove himself around in a station wagon loaded with camping gear, and he also demonstrated his shock machine, and victims lost their judgment and their social skills, but it made them quiet, and this pleased their families, although these dements or lobotomized people had temper problems and couldn't cope with small irritations, so the procedure fell out of favor. Less than a thousand people had become demence before the end of Hitler's war, and even after the death train stopped rolling, thousands of these procedures were being done every year. By 1952, 20,000 people had been turned into demence, and over half of the mental hospitals were regularly doing it, and when psychiatric drugs came around, lobotomy lost, it, lost its appeal to be replaced by chemical dementation. The book called Brave New World by Huxley had come out in 1932 that described Soma as the drug of choice in a technological society, and the search for a Soma drug had begun with the discovery of antihistamines in 1937. Manufactured in France during Hitler's war, histamine was found by studying ergot, which had been thought to be created by decomposing dead flesh. But histamine had been found in the living in 1927, and it was released when cells were injured. Histamine affected smooth muscles like the heart and the blood vessels in the brain, and would be released by stress and from cells that were crushed or sunburned or chemically injured by detergents or poison, and histamine also affected the stomach glands as well as the pain and itch nerves. Histamine used calcium to work, so the more histamine, the more it stole calcium from the bones, and the big discovery was that histamine was quelled in the brain by monoamine oxidase, or MAO. Isoniazid, or isonicotinic acid hydrazide, was created in 1951 for the treatment of tuberculosis, and it had mood-elevating mood-elevating effects in tuberculosis patients. And the following year, Dr. DeLay and his collaborators tried isoniazid on his depressed patients, and then Dr. Zeller found that ipronizide inhibited the en enzyme MAO. Brain cells released the neurotransmitter serotonin, that was related to the psilocybin mushroom, and serotonin could be found in a variety of fruits and nuts, and serotonin was in the sting of the wasp and the prick of the nettle, and a similar substance in the cahobe bean was used by Caribbean aborigines to alter their mood. 
The same psychoactive compound was secreted by certain toads and was called bufotenin and could be synthesized in the body from dietary tryptophan. Serotonin was isolated at the Cleveland Clinic in 1948 after Dr. Erzspammer and his colleagues were experimenting in Italy during Hitler's best years, and the serotonin made by the body was replaced daily, and it took from 1 to 17 hours to use up the old serotonin excreted with the help of the enzyme MAO. So when MAO was inhibited, the body would keep more serotonin. By 1951, serotonin could be made in a laboratory and it was quickly discovered that LSD was similar to serotonin and even acted as an antagonist. Serotonin was an autocoid, a word replacing the old word hormone, and the word autocoid came from the Greek autos or self with akos meaning medicine or medicinal treatment, and an autocoid was a neurohumor like serotonin. The brain made most of its serotonin, serotonin in the pineal gland where it served as a precursor to the hormone melatonin. And melatonin was involved with sleeping and MAO inhibitors suppressed REM so people could now sleep without dreams. After the 60s, the medical community would commit itself to giving drugs to mental patients, and by 1955, hundreds of different kinds of tranquilizers had been produced, and when Librium came along in 1958, 20 doses of dosages of amphetamine were made for every person in America that year. The first use of methamphetamine had been by Hitler's Blitzkrieg tank corps when they cut through Belgium like a hot knife through butter, and in 1963 Valium would appear, and by 1970 one woman in five and one man in ten was using sedatives and tranquilizers. Histamine removal was not interfered with by MAO inhibitors, and Fluxetine was invented in 1972 as an MAO inhibitor, and the Fluxetine Prozac, among others, was prescribed after 1972 with its popular side effect of weight loss, and according to the history of psychiatry, Prozac quite lightened the burden of self-consciousness, close quote. Prozac had an array of side effects too numerous to list, and fluxetine withdrawal was dangerous and so unpleasant that most people preferred to stay on the drug, shopping around between all the different brands and juggling the long list of symptoms and side effects. With the manufacture of these medicinal chemicals affecting the brain, the drug industry needed a market, so the DSM came out in 1952 as the official Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, and it would be revised through the years and used to match symptoms of mental distress with chemical concoctions purported to treat them. The DSM would list over 300 different mental disorders disorders, and since the cause of true illness was either traumatic, infectious, neoplastic, toxic, or autoimmune, a diagnosis of mental illness was difficult to explain as a science, while another field of study showed that malnourishment during prenatal development caused starved babies to go crazy when they grow up. Homosexuals were declared to be free of disease by the psychiatric community in 1974, and homosexuality was removed from the list of mental illnesses just as government laboratories began experimenting with AIDS, and after all, if homosexuals were merely mentally ill, it wouldn't do to murder them. Murder them. Given such actions, it would be difficult to take seriously any official psychiatric pronouncement about problems surrounding sexual orientation, the psychiatry of stress, or women and the menses. These matters could all apparently be pathologized and depathologized at will of the majority or following campaigns of insistent pressure groups. The underlining underlying failure to let science point the way emphasized the extent to which DSM-3 and its successors designed to lead psychiatry away from the swamp of psychoanalysis was in fact guiding it into the wilderness. History of Psychiatry, page 305. After the Great War, P. 
people talking about the new theories of Darwinism had decided that addiction was a scientific disease rather than a moral failing, and Darwin had been regarded as a scientist of the highest caliber, and in the 30s science was all the rage. The debate began in earnest whether drug addiction was a biological illness <clears throat> or was willful disobedience, and to use the DSM, the first question question asked had to be whether an organic factor was involved in the mental illness such as brain damage from injury or viral infection in childhood or whether the mental illness had been caused by the use of mind-altering substances such as alcohol or recreational drugs and the second question was whether those chemicals had been taken voluntarily the DSM described addiction as problematic if it caused, quote, interference with social or occupational functioning, close quote, which meant that if addiction were present and the person were asking for help, they would not be, quote unquote, mentally ill. Nonetheless, drug addicts became cannon fodder for psycho psychologists and psychiatrists, and psychiatry became more of a business than a science in the wake of socialized medicine, because the taxpayer was paying the bill and the government had deep pockets. A dictionary definition of the phrase socialized medicine was, quote, health care at nominal cost by means of government regulation of health services and subsidies derived from tr taxation, close quote, and the word socialism was defined as an economy where, quote, producers possess both political power and the means of producing and distributing goods, close quote, and under socialized medicine, the government was allowed to decide who was and who was not an addict. A scientific pursuit of psychiatry was impossible due to the doctor requiring the patient to supply subjective symptoms rather than objective proofs, and the psychiatrists were in competition with fortune tellers, priests, and bartenders, and so psychiatry required government intervention in order to stay in business. Well-meaning psychiatrists needed to convince the public that doctors worked better than handcuffs, and the realm of drug addiction became an issue of class warfare since the poor were less able to hide their addictions, and the judicial system figured they were better off with three hots in a cot if they were unable to support themselves on the outside. Legal representation became a matter of making due process and exercise in accommodating the system, and inmates involved in the drug and alcohol trade behind bars found many underpaid prison guards willing to enable and accommodate them. Addiction is also a quote-unquote family matter, as important as it is to help the patient, Educating, supporting, and counseling relatives may be the therapist's most valuable and enduring contribution. It's also a quote-unquote family matter. In another sense, health care professionals are at high risk for addiction, and they and their relatives are also quote-unquote our family. Essential Psychopathology by Gerald X. Maxman, M.D., New York, W.W. W. Norton and Company, 1986, page 140. Thomas Saws wrote The Myth of Mental Illness in 1961 that fully infuriated the burgeoning quote-unquote mental health industry. And Saws also wrote Ceremonial Chemistry in 1971. And Saws had moved to America from Hungary in 1938 and gotten a degree in physics before becoming a doctor in 1944. Thomas Saws had been born in Hungary in 1920, and his parents were Jewish, and Saws would repeat the warning from the Brookings Institute that we should, one, not assume that a thing is the cause of another simply because it always comes before another, like day following night, but day does not cause night, two, not suppose that a single thing makes another happen because the result is usually the result of a number of things, Three, not to believe that the whole world is just like some of the parts we know. Four, not to expect things to happen in the future just as they've happened in the past. And five, not to wish for only what we want. And six, not to see and believe only those things we want to see and believe. 
What remained was the miracle of the salvation of a cold beer on a hot day, the blessing of champagne at a wedding, the mercy of brandy at a funeral, and in the face of such immutable facts, the mental health business could not suppress addiction altogether, but worked diligently to suppress the symptoms and consequences of drinking. The mental health in industry used mind-altering drugs when a whole mind was needed to overcome addiction and turned the scientific model on its head with their theory that addiction was caused by quote-unquote mental illness rather than caused by the excessive use of mood-altering chemicals for which people paid good hard cash money. The mental health industry ignored the fact that quote-unquote getting crazy was why people so ardently used mood-altering chemicals in the first place, and the industry doubled down with their insistence that crazy people needed to use booze and drugs to help them cope with being mentally ill. Mr. Prime Minister, would you like something to drink? Churchill said, oh yes, bring me a martini. He downed three or four at a good clip. From there we progressed to the President's room at the Statler and got Churchill, who was in very good spirits by now, to the head table. Mr. Prime Minister, would you care to have a little something with your lunch? Churchill brightened and said, yes, I believe a scotch and soda. He sipped scotch right through the meal. By the time the press conference started, Churchill showed his drinks, but his pipe organ voice was sharp and sharp mind were not impaired. He started talking at one thirty, and the conference lasted till four thirty. Nobody who was there ever wished it was le one minute less. It was the most scintillating press conference I ever attended. He became poetic, and his command of the language carried us to heights of emotion. I remember an old congressman from Minnesota who said about Churchill that the more he drank, the more brilliant he got. I don't believe Churchill was ever quite that brilliant again. Drunk Before Noon, the behind-the-scenes story of the Washington Press Corps by Ken Hoyt and Francis Spatz Layton, New York, New Jersey, Prentice Hall, 1979, page 64 and 5. Alcohol was everyone's best medicine, and opium was used to treat DTs from alcohol withdrawal, and opium was most effective when mixed with alcohol, and cure-all potions contained mostly alcohol. But the opium in them took the alcohol debate into a whole new dimension. Opium was given freely as a painkiller because pain was the disease, and opium was also effective against dysentery and cholera when water purification had been neither known nor practiced. Poor people were less likely to get addicted because rich people were more likely to, likely to hire doctors, and doctors were in the habit of growing their own opium or staying in close touch with people who were. Medical schools in Europe had been serious institutions, but American doctors were mostly trained as apprentices to doctors who already had a practice, and the apprentice would learn their trade by field experience, and because these doctors left much to be desired, Americans had learned to self-medicate, and the patent medicine industry in America had become big business. Fantastic formulas, which at best were ineffectual and at worst destroyed health, brought the patent medicine practitioners millions of dollars. Quacks and swindlers, they became outstanding members of their communities. They donated money to churches and political campaigns. They took a firm grip on the newspapers. And since they were respectable, typical examples of American enterprise and success, it became nothing less than socialism to challenge them the muckrakers crusaders for american liberalism by louis filler chicago a gateway edition henry regnery company 1950 1968 page 145 Patent medicines came from the sinful cities, and so had the limp-wristed, pencil-necked, bug-eyed, late-sleeping city people who couldn't even swing a pitchfork, according to Martin Booth in his Opium A History, and before 1850 most people lived and died within fifty miles of their own homes, and every so often a traveling salesman would come through, touting medical cures that were most effective if opium were included in the formula.' 
the secret ingredient known well before the writing of any history. As a young man in Vermont, Bill Wilson had lived next door to a little lady opium addict who sent him regularly into town to get her medicine, and when Bill was a senior in high school, his girlfriend died when her parents took her for surgery at Fifth Avenue Hospital in New York City to have a tumor removed. And Bill was so unhappy that he failed his German class and dropped out of school and went to live with his mother in Boston, who was an osteopathic doctor. Bill W. made up his German class, and his mother sent him to special tutoring for entrance into MIT at the Massachusetts School of Technology, but Bill failed the entrance exam, so in 1914 he went to Norwich Military School instead, and Bill W. would earn his stripes by standing up for his younger classmates in a hazing incident. Bill W. had grown up on war stories, and he'd gone with his grandfather to hear Woodrow Wilson's speech at the 50th anniversary of Gettysburg, and Bill had been class president in high school and captain of the baseball team, and he sang in the glee club and played in the orchestra, and after the death of his girlfriend, Bill W. started having something like seizures where he couldn't get enough air and would panic and his stomach would hurt from heartburn and his legs would go numb. The doctors thought there was something wrong with his heart, but when Bill W. got into military school, his health straightened out right away. Bill W. was sent to Plattsburgh, New York, as part of the preparedness movement that was started by Anglophiles who were building officer training schools right after the Lusitania went down. And Vermont was located on the other side of Lake Champlain from Plattsburgh, New York, and during the American War of Independence, Vermont had been doing business with the British. Plattsburgh had been attacked on the 6th of September in 1814, and the British surrendered five days later on September 11, 19, 1814. The British surrendered five days later on September 11, 1814, after over a dozen warships from both sides had faced off on Lake Champlain, while British warships were bombarding Fort McHenry in Baltimore. The American victory at the Battle of Plattsburgh put a stop to the British invading from Canada and the Scottish name of Plattsburgh, New York, would be changed in 1951 to the German spelling of Plattsburgh without the H on the end. Bill W. was eight years younger than Monty, and on the day that A.A. was born, on the 10th of June, in 1935, Monty was 47 years old and would live another 41 years, while Bill W. was 39 years old and would live for another 36 years. And while Bill W. was writing the big book, Monty was sent to India for three years as an instructor at the Indian Army Staff College after he had served in Palestine, where he'd been promoted to colonel in June of 1934, and before that, Monty had helped to write the British Infantry, Infantry Training Manual in 1929. Bill W.'s name had the same meaning as something that was due for payment, as well as its opposite meaning of that which was used to make payment, and Monty's name meant all that could be expected, as in giving something the full Monty, or being the most achievable or the most humanly possible. And Monty also meant the stack of cards left over in a game after each player had taken their share. The name Monty also came to mean being left naked at the end, and Bill W.'s last drink of Applejack or Apple Brandy was also called Blue Ruin or Strip and Go Naked. George Washington had been a minor officer in the British Army, while France was being squeezed out of America and Washington had learned to fight in the French and Indian Wars at a time when Spain had lost their armada and been unable to bring troops over to join in the American land grab. From Washington's service in the British Army, he knew that Rogers of Rogers Rangers was steadfastly loyal to England rather than to the colonies, so Washington allowed Rogers only a small commando group called the Queen's Rangers, but they didn't do very well, and Rogers would die alone in poverty in London in 1795. 
Although George Washington had denied Rogers a commission in the American army, he had made Rogers' right-hand man Clark a general, and Clark's brother died of smallpox in 1757 at Fort William A. Henry while the French were accepting Roger Rain Rogers' Rangers' surrender. The day before they were supposed to be released to the British at Fort Edward, local Indians had gotten drunk and murdered all the British prisoners and then dug up all the dead British and subsequently got the smallpox. And then the fort had burned to the ground and the drunken Indians carried the smallpox back to their own villages. Rogers' rangers were split between the Americans and the British and many of them had served under Benedict Arnold, who would become a general in Washington's army in 1775 for the American War of Independence. And Benedict Arnold switched sides in 1780 because he hated the French, although he had been an effective commander since 1775 and had helped capture the fort at Ticonderoga and defended Valcour Island in Lake Champlain. Benedict Arnold was put in command of West Point overlooking the Hudson River, and when he became a traitor, Benedict Arnold wanted to surrender the fort at West Point to the British, but his plan was discovered and thwarted. Benedict Arnold had been wounded in October of 1777, and they wanted to amputate his leg, but instead they, instead they set it two inches shorter, and he spent five months in bed recovering, where he started writing letters to some British with complaints and requests for more opium. Because Benedict Arnold would, re re would remain unfit for active duty, Washington appointed him commander of Philadelphia, and Benedict Arnold made a great deal of money through his position, and in 1778 he met a British woman and fell in love with her and would expand his business dealings with the British through his wife's friends. After switching sides, Benedict Arnold asked to be posted to the British East India Company, but was made a general for the British instead, and he was told to go fight Americans, and so he burned New London to the ground and murdered surrendering Americans. When Benedict Arnold would die in London in 1801 at the age of 60. He was still complaining of leg pain that was ascribed by the doctors and historians to gout and dropsy. When George Washington became the commander-in-chief of American troops, he had brought a German baron over to be his inspector general and to train the American soldiers, and the first U.S. Army manual was written by this Baron von Steuben, whose real name was Frederick William Augustus Henry Ferdinand, and the manual was called, was called the Blue Book, and from then on every soldier knew exactly how to survive on the battlefield. The British tried to cut America in two by marching down from Canada along the Hudson Valley to join with Clinton in New York, but the red coats trapped in Saratoga were forced to surrender to the Americans and to celebrate the freedom won by America, the Chinese sent fire fireworks. When George Washington had been down to a few thousand soldiers in 1776, whose conscriptions were expiring on New Year's Day, an Irish patriot told Washington that the English commander holding Trenton was a bad drunk, so on Christmas Day Washington had crossed the Delaware to attack Trenton, and while it seemed, while it was a small victory, that success gave the Americans the heart to keep up the fight. Many Americans were descended from solid British stock who had lived in America for over a hundred years, and when the English had killed their king in 1649, Parliament had passed a law that any five English meeting together who were not family members would be arrested, fined, and shipped overseas for seven years after the third offense. Many of those banished overseas had decided that it was nicer in Australia or in America than it was back in England, and the exiled groups refused to go back to England after their sentence had been served, so Parliament revoked the illegal meeting law in 1672, eight years after its passage, after tens of thousands of the best English minds had been freely transported to America. 
As the Americans were demanding fair treatment from their British overlords in 1774, Lord North brought a bill to the English Parliament granting all the Americans' demands except independence. But when the French declared for America, the British turned against America and the bill failed. France, delighted to pay England back for the Seven Years' War, recognized America's independence, so England de declared war on France, and many good men in England begged for re reconciliation, but none spoke up for appeasement when it came to getting, getting along with Frenchmen. Spain chose France over the godless English, also declaring support for America, and Spain fought gallantly but vainly with the English fleet at Gibraltar while the rest of Europe banded together against England to leave the British crown alone against the world. Motherland Russia and her neighbors, including Holland, Denmark, and Sweden, had grown tired of the British boarding their ships to search for contraband, and the British claimed to be looking for contraband of war, but the boarding, searching, and seizing had been going on for as long as anyone could remember. The British had defeated Washington at the Battle of Brandywine in 1777, but the British failed to follow up on the victory. And while the Americans lost the war militarily, the British were starved out by the presence of the French fleet and forced to surrender at Yorktown in 1781. America made Britain sign the Treaty of Versailles in 1783, also called the Treaty of Paris, that gave the Americans independence and left England 100 million pounds sterling deeper in debt. The Treaty of Versailles signed by the British in 1783 gave Florida and the Bahamas to Spain as a thank you, and emboldened by the gusto of the Americans, the French would have a revolution of their own in 1789. Columbus had first landed on the Bahamas before reaching the mainland, and Columbus had sent his brother to ask England's Henry VII to sponsor his journey but had been turned down and Columbus had made an offer to the King of Portugal twice, but was turned down again because the Portuguese had just discovered the Cape of Good Hope and no longer needed to sail west to find a shorter route to China. The King and Queen of Spain financed his journey, <clears throat> and Columbus had followed the trade winds for five weeks before reaching the Bahamas, and he would sail to America a total of four times, each time believing he had reached China. The first Columbus expedition brought syphilis back in 1492, and a cure would not be found until 1943 with penicillin, and Jefferson had signed a contract with the Spanish in 1791 allowing Americans to travel on the Mississippi if they used only the eastern bank of the river, but many Americans just went and lived in the Wild West anyway, since there weren't enough Spanish around to stop them. The British built military bases on isolated islands like the Falklands and Bermuda, so wherever the British would sail, they could find a red coat or a red telephone booth that would lead them to the local commanding officer who could point them towards a local bed and breakfast. But much energy had been wasted by the English, looking for the northwest passage to China and India, and a good many had died in the search. While Europeans had been on their way to Jamestown, they were shipwrecked on the 21-square-mile island of Bermuda that was 500 miles away from anywhere. After a three-day hurricane crashed them onto the island, and Bermuda had been uninhabited, and the 150 Europeans from the shipwreck were forced to live on the island for almost a year before building two boats from what was left of the ship. Two people stayed behind to live on the island, one of them a convicted murderer, and one of the sailors going on to Jamestown would later marry Pocahontas, and when they arrived in Jamestown, everybody was starving to death. The captain promised to return to England to bring food back to them, but he died before even reaching Bermuda, and they buried his heart on the island and took the rest of him back to England, and his mission to save Jamestown went to the grave with him. The slave trade would make the island of Bermuda wealthy, 
and when the American War of Independence broke out, the people on Bermuda were British subjects but gave all the gunpowder stored by the English there to the Americans even before a letter from Washington arrived with that request. Three days after the Battle of Plattsburgh, an oversized American flag raised over Fort McHenry was seen by Francis Scott Key, who was being held prisoner on board a British ship of the line that had been captured from the French. Francis Scott Key was inspired to write the Star-Spangled Banner poem that would become the American national anthem after it was set to the music of an old English drinking song. The Mayflower had sailed for America in 1620 with 120 Americans on board, and in 1629 apples were imported from England, and apple juice was the color of clear liquid gold, and when left unattended in the open air, apple juice turned into hard apple cider. When the cider was left outside to freeze, the alcohol rose to the top that could be bottled as apple jack or apple brandy, and because it was plentiful and simple to manufacture, apple cider was the thing to drink, and Johnny Appleseed became an American hero. Apple cider was twice as strong as beer and half as strong as wine, and drinking apple cider differentiated Americans from the rum-drinking British. Apple cider and other alcoholic drinks harbored fewer pathogens than plain water, and people who drank beverages that had been boiled during the alcohol-making process remained healthier, while water was considered fit only for animal consumption. Hauling water was an arduous, messy task, and water from the Mississippi needed to stand until a fifth of it settled to the bottom, and water in the winter had to be thawed, and it would not be until 1842 that an aqueduct was built in New York City so people had something to drink other than water mixed with alcohol. In the old country, Beer and cider had been made in monasteries by dedicated monks, so the early colonists respected these non-royal beverages and would seal a full bottle into the cornerstone of a church or a building to consecrate it. Tea cost more than milk, thanks to the British tax on tea imports, and the temperance folks tried to get the tax on tea cut in half, but people still didn't want to drink tea and Americans made root beer instead with its minor alcohol content for storage, and they left tea drinking to, quote, the sick and those who, like British lords, were incapable of bodily labor, close quote. The Alcoholic Republic and American Tradition by W. J. Rorabaugh, New York and Oxford, Oxford New University Press, 1979, page 99. Ministers <clears throat> making house calls were religiously offered alcohol, and the doctor would be given some too, and apple brandy was used as medicine to cure colds and flu, and it was mixed with flour to quell insect bites, and it was combined with wood ash and lard to stop infection in open wounds. It was abnormal not to drink alcohol, and there were laws that people had to keep a certain amount of alcohol available, and a life insurance company charged higher rates for people who refused to drink. At election rallies, beer, wine, cider, punch, and rum were given away freely, and the Supreme Court justices would buy cases of good wine at taxpayer expense to drink while they considered cases. The term bitters covers a multitude of potent, concocted, potent concoctions. Among them toddies, a mixture of rum, sugar, and the pulp of roasted apples, drunk hot or cold according to the season slings or long sups, half spirits, half water, sweetened and spices, flips, also called tiffs, rum, beer, and sugar to which a burned bitter flavor was imparted by stirring with a red-hot flip iron, meridians, brandy and tea, manathan, beer, rum, and sugar, hotchpotch, the same, warmed, syllabub, warm milk, wine, and sugar, Rum, whiskey, and brandy were sluiced down lunch and dinner, and before bedtime prayers a nightcap or two was deemed an indispensable precaution against night chills. Ardent spirits, the rise and fall of prohibition by John Kobler, New York, J.P. 
G.P. Putnam Sons, 1973, page 29 and 30. <clears throat> a letter from Cotton Mather in 1682 described, quote, sanctioning piracy to secure a cargo of rum, close quote. And Mather wrote, there is now a ship at sea called the Welcome, which has on board an hundred or more of the heretics and malignants called Quakers, with W. Penn, who is a the chief scamp at the head of them. Ardent Spirits, page 28. <clears throat> Mather said that the ship would be waylaid near Cape Cod and the crew traded into slavery in exchange for rum and sugar for Mather and his own church, and the letter was signed, Yours in ye bowels of Christ. People had learned from their Bibles that water mixed with wine kept away disease, and Cotton Mather was not only a firm believer in the virtue of drinking alcohol, but was a righteous prosecutor of pirates and witches. In England, <clears throat> drinking had begun in earnest after Henry VIII freed the English from the rule of the church, and the Black Death had freed peasants to come to the city by killing off the people who would have forced them to stay on the nobility's estates. As towns grew, the water supply became too polluted to drink, so people drank water that had been purified with alcohol, and William Penn would own a brewery of his own in Philadelphia. Alcohol was an incentive to work, and farmers used beer to entice laborers to bring in the harvest, since a crop had to be sold before the help could be paid. And alcohol made the harvest fun, and people also thought that alcohol made them stronger. Charity was solicited over alcohol, and an Irish wake was about raising money to pay for the funeral. And in Scotland and Ireland, people needed to do something with all the grain that wasn't good enough for their animals. Alcohol was used medicinally, and doctors gave alcohol to patients in the hospital. And at home, alcohol helped to digest food that was often spoiled. H. G. Wells called the 15th century the age of fermentation and the distinction between those who drank imported wine and those who drank homemade beer was a leftover from the days when pharaohs drank wine while their slaves drank beer. The people drinking beer were healthier than the wine drinkers because the stuff that made beer was boiled when they made it, and all along the Roman roads in England so many alehouses had served so much beer in the tenth century that the king tried to close them down for the good of the English people, or at least limit them to one per village, but it turned out to be an impossible task. With the growth of technology, machines and factories made the workplace not so much fun anymore because instead of short periods of hard work, the factories needed people all day long every day doing the same thing over and over, and before factories the workplace had been not just for working but a location where people went to be social. In factories, work was no longer a lifestyle, but had become a mere job, and their only change of routine was going to church or to court, and while there were few enough festivals to give the factory workers a holiday, there was always alcohol. In the cities there was more free time to drink, instead of just growing food and raising livestock, and the Corn Laws of 1815 limited the trade of alcohol-producing grains, and in 1830 English pa England passed the Beer Act that was supposed to be about free trade and the Corn Laws, but it hurt the poor because the rich could buy their alcohol ready-made. On English farms they would just let corn sit for a few weeks to work itself into alcohol, while the poor commoners living in the city had trouble brew brewing their own because they lacked the necessary supplies and the space to make and store the brew. Drinking places were public places where everyone could gather, and most people went to taverns because it was the only public place they were allowed to enter, and a good amount of trade went on in the taverns, and the tavern was also used as the bank. Business was not so much about money, but about social relationships, and deals would be sealed with a healthy toast, witnessed by the gathering and recorded in their memories, and taverns were for local people, while inns were places where travelers could drink. <clears throat>